Now, how many of you think it's a little unfair that Tom will pick on kids a little bit? Does anyone have that feeling like when he comes up here and he picks on them and asks them to do stuff that, that we're not sure he would do? So, Tom, come here. So we are entering our third week of the series, right, of Shattered, Finding Hope in Community. And I love, it was such a great message today, right? Such a great, uh, how how brave do you feel? (laughs) Not brave right now. (laughs) Well, here's what I'd like you to do. I would also like you to come and stand on this chair. And, And just face that way, okay. So think about this, and we are in this series that we talk about uh, community. Am I going to uh, have to do this the whole 20 minutes? Or? <laughs> like I'm going to be done in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in, in this series, we are talking about community, and Job in particular, right? And we know that Job was going through some really hard stuff in the midst of this. And today we're going to talk about, in particular, like who is your support system? Like, who is the people that come around you in this time and day? And I love, it was such a great children's message to talk about, like, the support community. And one of the things that I've noticed in the research that's going on, we, just coming out of COVID, right, we know that community was kind of hit with COVID, right? In fact, we still don't know the results that are going to happen because of COVID. Uh, we're studying kids and the effects of that. Teachers know that the classrooms are different. Corporations know that that their, their company is different because of COVID. And we love to blame COVID for all this lack of community, right? But here's what I've noticed. They were looking at a bunch of research back in the 70s, and it said from the 1970s to now, there's, there's been a shift in community already. It said, like, when you were talking about like, people behind you and stuff like this, it said in the 70s that two-thirds of people had a group behind them that they felt like could support them. And about 20 years later, 25 years later, they've come and said only a third of people feel like they've got a support group to come behind them and support them. In that same time frame, they said that three times the amount of people, they they, asked someone, like, do you have a confidant? Do you have someone you can go to when something happens? Someone that you could go to, to to just support you and encourage you. And in that same time, three times the amount of people said, I I don't have that person, to the point where there's more people that say, I don't have one single person behind me to catch me. There's more people that don't feel like they have anyone than have someone. You did well. All right. I just want to embarrass you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which is amazing. Think about that. Like in the most vulnerable moments when you're standing, you're exposed and something's going on in your life and you're up there and you need someone to fall, uh, you need someone to fall on, someone who can help you, that majority of people feel like they don't even have one person in their life to do that. Is that pretty amazing? Like, is that not sad? I mean, think about like all the hurt and the suffering that's going on in the world today and there's not even one person to support and catch them. How many people feel like that in the midst of their suffering. Well, I've been doing a little bit of search of what does it mean to have true community. And Charles Vogel has a great book that calls The Art of Community, and he says this. His definition of community is this. Communities are created when at least two people begin to feel concerned for each other. I love that definition, right? So you have two people across from each other and said, I, I, my eyes are on you. Your eyes are on me. And so when, I, when we get together, I'm thinking about you, you're thinking about me. And and which is a hard thing to do sometimes, right? Because we are so used to thinking about ourselves and our happiness and our stuff and how we are going through life and stuff like this. But true community has our eyes more on the other person than has on ourselves. It's easier to look in the mirror than it is to look at someone else. And one of the things that they're finding is they're doing a bunch of research. And in that, they said that we just don't have deep connections with people anymore. I love Robert... <clears throat> excuse me, uh, political scientist Robert Putnam from Harvard says it this way. He says, uh, we root for the same team, we share the same interests, but we are unaware of each other's existence. Our ties are short, they're to common symbols, to common leaders, and perhaps common ideas, but not to one another. They're surface level. And, and, and maybe I, I, you hear it all the time, do you not? Like when you go to someone and you're saying, hey, how are you doing? And people are like, I'm fine. I'm good. 
Anyone else fall into that thing? Like, I, I'm not going to tell you too much about my life. I'm just going to stay on the surface and everything's okay. Uh, and then how quickly do these guys are terrible at this, right? Larry, like, hey, what about the draft? Now, we'll talk deep about the draft, the NFL draft. We'll go 20 minutes with that, but we won't talk about our feelings and the things that are truly going on in our life. Our life might be falling apart. Our, fi- our finances may be uh, going south. Uh, our relationships are falling apart. But we come in front of each other and we just said, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. Things are great. Anyone find themselves in that moment of just kind of being surface level and, and saying, uh, painting a picture of what we're not, right? Because it's just easier to do that within community. And it, what happens is it just doesn't go very far. And so think about a time in your life where you received something, where you were going through something, and, and you needed a confidant. You needed someone to come and to have your back, to catch you. And, and, and who is that person? Well, for many of us in those moments, sometimes, if we're honest, we tend to gravitate towards isolation. We tend to gravitate towards um, being kind of private and not sharing the stuff that's going on in our lives. When I was a sophomore in, in college, I went through a really hard year, probably the hardest year of my life, or at least one of them. And, and I just lost my grandpa. I, I lost a friend of mine and was just really struggling with, with different aspects of school and things like that. And, and here's what I found in the midst. I was, I mean, I was a mess. I was broken. I was hurting. And in that moment, here's what I did. I went to isolation. I went to my dorm room. I, I withdrew from the friends. I had some great friends in my life, but I withdrew from them and just kind of sat in my suffering, sat in that moment. Uh, anyone kind of gravitate towards that in your suffering? Like it's sometimes it's easier to do that, Right. But I was fortunate enough, I had a couple people in my life who saw it. And they, come and they, they, they came out and they said, hey, Derek, I know it's like you're, you're not hanging out with us. What's going on? Are you okay? And, and as I started to share a little bit more, I remember those conversations almost like they were yesterday. And I started letting them in a little bit on the things I was going through. And, and it led to some really deep and great conversations Here's another thing I found out. We said this, like when you go through suffering, the old adage, right? Like you, try, you find out who your true friends are. You heard that, right? Are you amazed in the time where you go through that? It's the people that rise up to the top to be your support team and those who, who run away. Anyone else amazed by that? Some of the people that you thought were your support system, they're like, that's messy. I'm out of here. And some people you're like, I didn't even think we knew each other that well. And all of a sudden you're at my house with a meal. Like, it, it's amazing what happens, like the, what you learn about, about people in the midst of those suffering times. Who are those people in your life that run to you when things are breaking in front of you? Now, I love Job's story. As we get into this, we're going to talk about his support system and who Job had in his life. And... Uh, and, and last week, we talked about week one, week one, we had the accuser, and the accuser came to God and said, hey, uh, uh, you, God said to him, hey, you know, Job, like, he's a great guy, like, he's amazing, right? He's so good, and, and the accuser, Satan comes and says, well, of course he's great, he's got everything. He's got a great support system, he's got the riches, he's got money, he's got everything, but you take that away and watch what he does. Watch what he's going to do, and God says, I know what he's going to do, so I'll allow you to do it. You can do all that stuff, but you can't harm him. He puts a boundary. And what we talked about this, what did, what did Satan do? He did everything right up to that boundary. He pushed absolutely everything to that point. He took it all. And what did God, we said, what did Job do in the midst of that? Remember what he did? He said this, he said, hey, naked I came, naked I'm going to return God. And he worshiped him in the midst of that, which is pretty amazing. And say, so, well, of course he's going to do that. But you haven't, you said I couldn't hurt him. But if he was afflicted with suffering, like personally afflicted, you're going to see a different story. And so God says, okay, I'm going to allow you to do this. And Pastor Joe was talking about this last week. I'm going to allow you to do that, but you can't, he puts a boundary again, you can't take his life. You can take everything to this point, but you can't take his life. What does Satan do? He does it again. He takes everything to the boundary that was allowed. Took it all. And it says that he was covered with sores from the bottom of his foot to the very top of his head. And it said he was, he was so infested with sores that his friends couldn't recognize him. I mean, imagine the pain and the suffering that must have been going on in his life. Think about you, the friend that you know that you know the closest, you're confident, the person that you've been walking with, think about going into their house and going, I don't, I don't even know who you are. I can't even recognize you. I mean, that is deep, 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 deep suffering. 
And so Satan brings them all the way to that time and says, hey, um, we're going to see how you react. Now, Job has a support system. We learn about Job's support system a little bit in this verse. I love it. It says in verse 211, it says this. It says, they made an appointment with him to show him sympathy and comfort, which is kind of funny like when people are in suffering. Hey, by the way, can I get on your calendar to come and show you symphony and uh, to show you some comfort? Right? We don't really do that. We just show up typically and to do that. But they, they said, hey, I just, I just need to be in your presence. And I love what they did. What, this is what happens. Like in that moment, in that moment, uh, by the way, have you ever been to the point where like a friend of yours has said something like, hey, by the way, this is what's going on. I just lost this person in my life that I love or I just came from the doctor and this is the news or um, uh, I'm, my, my, the relationship that I am, I'm done, we're, it's over with. Have you ever received that phone call? And, and there is, there's this space, right? There's a space between that phone call and the next time you see them. And I, I don't know about you, but anyone else have a little anxiety of like what they're going to do when they see that person? Any, anyone else feel that? Like, what, what do I say? What, what do I do? How, how do I help? You know, I, I just want to fix this situation. I want to bring them comfort. I want to bring them help. I want to, I, I want to bring them some love and care into this mist. And there are times, I, I, I know there are times I've walked into the hospital room and I'm going, right, boy, God, you need to show up because I don't even know what to do in this moment. Anyone else feel that in that moment? Like, what do I do? Well, I'm telling you, we can learn something from Job's friends. So uh, his Job, Job's friends comes in and says there's four things that he does. The first thing they do is when they arrive, they raised their voices and they wept. And they tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. And li- listen to this. They sat with him for seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him. I, I, I can't go an hour without speaking. <laughs> Can you imagine what that was like? Like you come into the presence of that and you just saying, you know what, I'm just going to sit here. And it's a good reminder, like in the midst of the hardship and suffering of life, sometimes we just need the presence of people, don't we? We just need people to come into our space and sit with us. I, I, I think about like back in, my, back in my own story, I think about my dad. When I lost my dad, I was a seventh grader. And so I'm thinking like my whole life has just changed. And, and here's the thing that I realized. I don't remember a thing that anyone said to me that whole time. I don't remember what people, when they came into the house, I don't remember what they said. I don't remember what they spoke. Here's what I remember. I just remember they showed up. I just remember their faces. I remember my uncle who got in the car on the spot, heard the news, got in his car, drove six hours, comes into the front door, weeping, braces me, hugs me tightly, and just cries. I don't remember anything else but that. I mean, it was, it was gospel. It was love. It was a confidant. It was support. It was presence. He didn't say anything. And sometimes I think what we, we feel like when we come in, like we got to be a community that explains everything, that we give them the reason that we try to fix it. Anyone else a fixer? Right? Like you come into the point, you're like, hey, I just want to, let me, let me explain this. And here's another thing I think about suffering. Like it is easier to be present in the beginning of suffering, but the longer that suffering goes on, on the more that we want to explain it. Anyone else notice that in their life? I notice it in my life. Like the longer that people are in it, I want to, I want to give them the reason for why they might be going through that. And so you're, I'm, I'm drawn from silence and presence to all of a sudden saying, well, let me tell you what's going on. And we see this within Job's, within Job's too. Job comes back and he's got his wife and his three friends. And his wife says, well, let me, let me speak into this. Job, curse God and die. That's her advice. Okay, just curse God and die. That's <laughs> real comforting, right? Eliphaz comes in and says, you need to fear God. That's, the, that's your problem, Job. You don't fear him enough. And so this stuff is coming to your life because it is a reflection of you and your relationship with God. I, I, I love so far comes in and says this. Uh, actually, Job, you deserve worse. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, if you've got a friend like that, get rid of them, right? Like, like, you think you're suffering now. Like, you should be much worse. Your suffering should be much, like, ten times this. That's his words. Like, you deserve worse than this. And Bildad comes in and he says this, hey, uh, you must have done something. I don't know what you did in your life, but you did something. It must have angered God. And now you are suffering for it. You need to repent. That's your issue. And then we know from the beginning, the story says this, that, that Job did nothing. 
Job did nothing. And we know that sometimes that's a part of our story, that we do stuff and we suffer the consequences and stuff like that, but that wasn't Job's story. And I love what happens, and, if, and I'm telling you, like, if you get into the situation where, where you are walking with someone and suffering, and you feel like you've got to explain their suffering and try to help them to understand it, and to give them the reason for why they're in this, you need to hear what Job says to his friends. When you're tempted to try to give them reasoning, and to try to put yourself into trying to figure out what God is doing or what God is allowing or how he's moving in this situation, you need to hear Job that said to his friends, he said, stop talking. That's what he says in chapter 16. Stop talking. You are horrible comforters. Quit pointing at me. He said, I need you just to walk with me and to sit with me, to love me, to support me in the midst of what is going on. Stop talking. Just recognize the power of presence. And then he comes back and he says this, verse 19, he comes, and, and I love, this is such a good move. This is such a beautiful move that, that we need to hear. We need to hear. And Job says this, I'm not looking to you. I'm not looking to you. You're not the one that's going to solve this. You're not the one that's, gonna, that's going to redeem this. You're not the one who's going to bring comfort into the midst of this. He says in verse 19, he comes back and he says this, he says, quit pointing at me and start looking to him. Quit pointing to the world and the things around here and start pointing to, to God. My advocate is not here. My advocate is up there. And in verse 21, he comes back and says this. He says, you know what I really need? I need someone to speak to God on my behalf. I need a mediator who comes in and says this, that I want, just, just come to God on my behalf. Speak on for me and what I'm going on. Because sometimes in the midst of my suffering, I just can't speak for myself. And I love this. You were created for this. It's actually part of your DNA. From the very beginning, God looked and saw Adam and he said, it's not good for him to be alone. He needs a helper. He needs someone to go through life. He needs someone to mediate for him, to help him, and to be a support and an advocate. It's in our DNA of how we were created to walk with people in suffering. But if we're honest, so many times in our suffering, we love isolation. We love to sit in our suffering. Now, here's, here's what I noticed. I was, as we were doing some more research into this thing, there was a couple things that came out with some researchers, and, and I, it's so important in this. And I think that for those of you who are suffering, there's something you need to hear in that. And for those of you who are walking with people suffering, there's something you need to hear in this too. Uh, I think about psychologist Roy Baumeister who says this. He says, deep connections matter, which involves frequent interactions with people plus persistent care. You think about this, the amount of interactions you have with people and doing care in their life leads to deeper connection. Carolyn Schwartz says this, she's a social researcher, she says, giving help is more important predictor, predicator of mental health in our lives than receiving help. I mean, think about that, that's amazing. It says this, actually, if you want better health in your life, start thinking of other people. Start pouring into other people, start loving on other people. Don't, don't sit in the midst of your suffering and going, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to feel sorry. You start pouring into other people and what you're going to start noticing is you'll start noticing your health get better. You'll start noticing your attitudes getting better. You'll start noticing your, your help will get better in your life. Uh, Baumeister says this, being a giver was related to experiencing meaningfulness while being a taker diminishes it. Like, if you give, it actually increases meaningfulness, it increases purpose, it increases health. But if you're just constantly in this, this taking mode, like give, give, give to me, give to me, give to me, it actually diminishes our health. And I started to think in the midst of this, as we're going through this, I started to think about Jesus and his social circle. Right, Jesus had his disciples and he lived life together. And I think about that time like of his greatest suffering and his greatest time of need where he needed a social circle more than anyone else, where he needed a support group and an advocates to be on, on half of them. And what happened to him? His disciples, his deepest and friends, it tells us this, that our natural inclination is always to do what's best for us. That's how we naturally think. That's the sins of the flesh. We just naturally get there. And it says this, in that time, he says to his three disciples, his closest friends, he goes and he prays, right before he dies in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says this, here's what I need you to do. To, I need you to speak on, on, I need you to pray for me. 
I, I need you to, to be my mediator to the heavenly father while I go and talk to him. Would you stay here and you, would you pray? Three times he did this. And all three times, what did they do? He comes back and what were they doing? They're sleeping. Right? Their needs got to it. They were too tired and they fell asleep. And on the third time, he came back, and they came to arrest him, and he had all his, his crew around him. And what happened in the midst of the, as they, as they arrest him? They, they fled. It was too much risk involved with that. I don't know what they're going to do to me. I'm gone. I'm out of here. And Peter followed him all the way. And in his trial, as he's isolated, it was just him, just him on trial, all alone. Here's Peter in the courtyard, probably one of his greatest advocates, and someone comes up and says, hey, don't you? I, I know you. I know you. You're with him. You're a part of his support group. You're a part of his network. And Peter goes, nope, I don't know him. Don't know him. Don't know what you're talking about. I'm out of here. I'm done. And the reality is it's so easy for us to do that, to take our own ways and think of our own needs and our, our, our time and our schedules and our things. But there was one group. There was one group that followed him all the way to the cross. And as he's sitting up there for six hours and he is suffering, suffering with all of our sins, the full weight of the whole world on him, they just sit there silently, watching, crying, weeping, supporting. And I love this about Jesus. In his isolation, in his suffering, what's, the, what's one of the last thing he does? One of the last thing he does is he looks at his mom and he looks at one of his best friends, John, and he says this, Mom, take John as your son. John, take my mom as your mom. Walk together. Support each other. Care for each other. Mediate for one another. In his greatest moment of suffering, he's bringing community together. And I think about us, like, what does your community look like? Who is in your life? Who, are, who is God calling you to walk closer with, to love on, to support? And I started thinking, like, what does this look like in this day, right? It's easy, we can talk about this, but what does it look like? What does it look like to enter other people's suffering? And I think about our gospel lesson. It looks like four people who bring a paralytic who can't do anything on their own. And they bring him to the presence of Jesus and saying, I can't do anything, but he can do something for you. I can bring you into the presence of Jesus and see what Jesus is all about so that you know was his power and his might and his healing. And what did Jesus do first? He says, your sins are forgiven. That's the bigger issue. Your sins are forgiven. Now let's heal you. I have the authority to do both. And I think, what does it look like in this midst? It looks like walking with a mom and her two daughters, bringing a bed at the last minute with a bunch of groceries and saying to this, I, I know your life is hard and I know you're suffering and I know you've got finances and, and, and you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from, but it is coming into their life and it's walking with them and it's making sure that they, they've gone from their car to a house so that she doesn't have to give up her two girls. Beautiful Savior, we have people who are doing that. It, it looks like a, a person who is who's sitting by their friend as they're going through chemo treatment, just sitting in silence, just being present. It looks like sitting next to someone whose marriage and relationship is ending and they are just, just hurting and just sitting there and loving just being present. It, it looks like 30 people who, who aren't runners who are saying, I, I heard that there's 700 million people who don't have access to clean water, and I'm willing to go suffer for that. I'm willing to speak and to get into their territory to bring them something that they don't have. Beautiful Savior, we are called into this community. There's too many people here that were isolated and alone that don't have anybody. And the good news that Jesus says, no one's alone. I, it goes back to what Tom said. Like there is, there is a person that is there to catch them in everything and people don't know it. There's a person right, be, right behind them and they just don't know the hope that they have. There's people that don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior who will redeem all who believe in him. Beautiful Savior, we have a call to our community to go and to bring the good news of Jesus. They've got a helper. They've got an advocate. 
And just like Job said, like, all I need you to do is to speak on their behalf. And so, Heavenly Father, God, would you use us? Would you use us as a church? God, you said we hold good news, that you are the Redeemer, that you are the Restorer, that, God, you enter the midst of our suffering, that you bring people together. God, we don't ever have to walk through this alone, and I'm praying for anyone here today who's walking in isolation. God, would you give them a bravery to speak up and saying, I need to walk with somebody. I I need a support system. I need someone to mediate for me. I need someone to battle. And God, I'm praying that this place, this church, that we will battle for each other. We will step into the gaps. We will go into this community and love people that just need to be loved like you love them. God, use us. God, I'm praying as we get into this, you have you've given us an opportunity to walk with organizations who do this every day. I thank you for Good in the Hood and Care Portal and Trinity for every meal, for the Crystal Women's Clinic, Lord, for people every day who are loving and supporting people in the midst of their suffering. God, I'm praying for anyone here who's going through mourning, who's missing loved ones. I think about those who've walked with a loved one all their life, and Lord, they find themselves on this point where they wake up each morning without their loved one. Would you, would you bring us into their life to walk with them, to, to know that they're not lonely, to walk in the midst of that loneliness and going, we're here to support you, to love you, to care for you. God, we, we know there are people, we know there are people in Nebraska that were waking up this morning and all their stuff, like Job, was taken away. God, would you raise up the church in the midst of that to support and encourage, to bring the finances and help and resources and prayer into their lives in the midst of their suffering? God, we are your church. You created us for this. We just pray in all things, God, that you would help us to walk in that way.